I guess it seems only logical when we start any new endeavor, such as the sojourn into intercultural communication, to ask why. Why is this important? Why do we need to know this and what you know, benefit will it have for us in the long run? So uh, I wanted to do just that with this video. And let's, let's take a look at why study intercultural communication. Why is this important? Well, before we jump into the why, let me start with the what, and let's define intercultural communication just very briefly and very simply. It won't take long because intercultural communication is just communication between people from two different cultures. It's as simple as that. People from two different cultures. So uh, in a broadest, in the broadest sense, we, we tend to think of cultures as people from different countries. And that's certainly true that uh, different culture, different countries generally have different cultures or will have different cultures. And so um, that that's an appropriate, um, you know, topic of conversation. But culture doesn't just exist in different countries. Culture exists in different people all around us. We all have different cultures and co-cultures that we uh, subscribe to and that we belong to. So, um, so when we communicate with virtually anybody, we're really communicating with somebody from a different culture. So let's start with that, that intercultural communication is communication between people of two different cultures. And that really describes just about anybody we're going to come across to some extent or another. Some are vastly different than us and some are, are less significantly different than us in terms of culture, but just about everybody has a different culture, cultural makeup than us in some way. So so now that we know what intercultural communication is, let's talk about what we call the imperatives for intercultural communication or ICC, intercultural communication. And these imperatives are just things that, uh, that, that people generally point to as why this is important. Why do we study intercultural communication? Why is it important? It's important for these uh, six things that we're going to talk about, these six imperatives. Um, the first is the imperative for peace. I mean, I think mostly across the world, people are generally interested in living in peace with other people and to a certain extent coexisting with other people um, and, and, you know, living their own lives as, as peacefully as they can. And the best way that we can do that, one of the best ways that we can help to ensure that peace or, or encourage that kind of peace is to know people, because the more you know about someone else and, and about their culture, then the less likely you are to uh, really see them as uh, bad or even remember culture is not about bad or wrong or right or wrong or good or bad or anything like that. It's just about different. So the more we know about them, then the less foreign that they will seem and the less different than they will seem uh, to us. Uh, and those differences will seem smaller. Um, the more we get to know somebody, the more we can personalize that and, uh, and, and bring some humanity to that situation. It's not that different than when I used to go to my grandparents' farm as a kid or and in, in growing up in a farming community, but we go to my grandparents' farm and I remember talking to, to the people who live there, my grandpa and my aunts and uncles about, so what's that cow's name? You know, they raised cows and I said, well, what's that cow's name? And my, my grandpa would say, well, that's number 96 or that's number 42 or this. And I'd say, no, what's their name? And he said, they don't, they don't have a name. It's just a number. That's how we keep track of of what cows we have and who's healthy and whatnot. They don't, they don't really have names though. And I said, well, why don't they have names? And he said, well, uh, honestly, it makes it harder when they get older to, to, to do what we need to do, which is to either, you know, to, to, to you know, sell them off for beef or to, to, you know, to when they're no longer productive, then we, we don't really keep them around. So if they had names, that'd be harder to do. So when we start to think of cows as these cute, cuddly creatures with personalities, it makes it more difficult, right? To kill this type of animal or to eat this type of animal. Uh, fortunately, it's not difficult for me because it, first of all, they're delicious. And secondly, um, that's not how I grew up, the culture that I grew up in. But, but the, you can understand that the, the more we know about a person or a creature, then the harder that would be, right? So the, it, the same applies to people though, really. The more we know about these people, the less different they seem and the less, you know, foreign they seem, they become people, you know, if we can understand them, then, and we can, we can learn more about their culture and we communicate with them effectively in an intercultural way, then um, we can help establish peace in general with, with the people around us. Another imperative for intercultural communication is what we call demographic, the demographic imperative. Um, so the, we can look at people as a, as a makeup of, of uh, different statistics or different areas, different ages, different 
genders, different uh, generations, different things. And, and so uh, the more we understand about the differences in the demographics, then the more we um, will again sort of be at peace with that. Um, and the more we will understand them. Uh, and, and we live in an increasingly shrinking world, right? Where we're, we're exposed to people from different cultures more and more often now. Um, but even, you know, here in the United States, it's always been sort of a, known as the melting pot, right? The United States is the melting pot. Uh, and there are some people that say, well, that's not necessarily an, uh, the best analogy possible. Maybe it's not such a melting pot because we don't all merge, right? We see different cultures still exist within the United States. So it's more like a tossed salad, the American tossed salad, maybe where you have all these different ingredients and they all bring their own flavor and things. And then you have this sprinkling of, of Americanisms and that where they kind of blend together in a pleasant way. Uh, but they're not melting together in terms of everybody giving up their own identity and their own culture and things. But so when we understand the demographics of a population and the, and the, the background and their history and the, the unique and vibrant things that their culture brings, then we can um, have a better understanding of how to communicate with them and how to live again in peace together. And, and coexist more effectively. So um, when we understand the demographics, that's another imperative for why we should uh, be concerned with intercultural communication so that we can truly appreciate those demographics and, and understand their importance in effective communication. There's also an economic imperative. Um, quite frankly, just to, you know, if we want to bottom line things, there's an economic imperative for intercultural communication. Again, the world is a shrinking place. We see this massive growth in globalization of economy, right? That, that, uh, Companies are no longer, you know, you, you think about the time of, of um, John D. Rockefeller, for example, where they had to have a special dispensation to do business in a different state. Uh, he had, you know, the part of the challenge that Standard Oil faced under Rockefeller was that they were only legally really allowed to operate in one state. So they had to find ways around that. Well, now you can throw that out the window, right? I mean, uh, this different states is, is crossing state lines is no longer uh, an issue. That's, I mean, that's a done deal. Now we're talking about crossing global lines and, and the globalization of an economy. So if we're going to be part of a global economy, um, which we certainly are in the midst of, then we ought to increase our intercultural communication skills so that we can effectively communicate and, and you know, to, to leverage that, that economic uh, uh, status to the best of our ability. So just the, you know, and again, if you just want a pure bottom line uh, reason for studying intercultural communication, there's an economic component here, an economic imperative um, to it that, that can't be overlooked. There's also a technological imperative. I can, I keep coming back to this, but we live in an increasingly shrinking world, right? We live in what McLuhan called, Marshall McLuhan called a, a global village, really, right? And the, the technology that exists now has, has caused our world to really shrink in terms of communication. We're communicating across the world uh, much more frequently and much more easily than we ever did before, which has sort of created this global village in a sense, in, in the sense of an interconnectedness because of this technology um, that, that did not exist necessarily before and certainly become enhanced in, in recent years. This, the technology has, it can cause the world to, to shrink to a certain extent um, in terms of the, the amount of exposure we have to people from different cultures. It's also on the flip side of that created this sort of digital divide, what we call a digital divide though, right? The kind of the haves and have nots of technology. Um, it used to be that, uh, um, you know, that the big technology divide was, did you have a computer or not? Or did you have a smartphone or not? And that still exists to a certain extent. Now it's really, what kind of internet speed do you have? If you're one of the fortunate in the world that has a high capacity internet speed, then you are certainly better off than, than folks who do not because so much of the world relies on technology. And if you're missing that, then you're really at a disadvantage, right? So we have this digital divide between the technological haves and have nots as well. But, um, so increasing intercultural communication, um, can help us not only shrink that divide, uh, but certainly understand it a little better and understand the impact and the importance of that um, and how we relate to others. There's also an imperative uh, related to self-awareness. Um, this is, again, shrinking world, right? We're in a shrinking world. We're coming across other cultures more and more all the time. We're more exposed to them. We're engaging with people from different cultures in big ways and small ways on a daily basis, right? So there is a danger of, um, of things like ethnocentrism and different things, but we need to be more self-aware. We need to have an understanding 
uh, of ourselves. So we need to, to be cautious, first of all, of things like ethnocentrism, which is this belief that your culture is inherently superior to another. When we talk about culture, it's not about better or worse. It's not about good or bad um, or right or wrong. It's about different. Cultures are just different. And they just are. It's not a matter of, but ethnocentrism says, well, my culture is inherently better than you, right? So, um, so, so and better than yours. We need to avoid that. We need to watch that. So increasing our intercultural competence will um, help with our self-awareness and help us to divert from and avoid uh, ethnocentrism to a certain extent, but it also just helps us engage in self-reflexivity. Self-reflexivity, meaning understanding of oneself and one's place in society, um, in terms of how we fit in, where we fit in, you know, what's our what's our place, what's our role, what's our contribution, and just in in self-awareness and understanding, uh, an increased understanding of intercultural communication will help us fill in the, that picture a little more. We'll provide more depth to that picture uh, of ourselves, even. And then finally, we really just have an ethical imperative. There's an ethical imperative for intercultural communication. This, this ethical imperative and, and intercultural communication really is the sense of a moral compass, um, whether something is, uh, you know, again, culture is not about um, good or bad. It's not about right or wrong. Um, but, uh, but there is certainly a sense of, uh, of being aware of, of privilege, for example. Related to a culture, we're coming to a new understanding of what that means, and whether it's racial privilege or economic privilege or or whatever um, privilege we are uh, experiencing or not experiencing. Um, there's uh, certainly that's a, a part of this as well, and we have an ethical obligation to understand um, like in our place and our our the, the privilege that exists and 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 how our culture and our perspective impact all that. Um, then there's also this idea of, of relativist versus universalist um, uh, philosophies. Um, the idea that, uh, that for, for, for example, in culture, when we talk about relativist um, views of culture, we talk about the idea that all perspectives are unique and valid, as opposed to a universalist um, philosophy of culture, which is that there are fundamental absolutes, regardless of where you're from and what your beliefs are. There are certain things that are absolute. Uh, and the truth is really probably so Somewhere in the middle. I mean, there are, there are certain, there's certainly validity to every um, cultural perspective, and there's certainly room to consider those different things. Now, are there are there things that are probably fundamentally you know, absolute? Sure, you know, I think most cultures would agree that murder is bad, for example, uh, and that we ought to take care for children, and that we, you know, things like that. Um, but uh, but uh, these can be taken to extremes, and so we have an ethical understanding from an intercultural sense to understand where our culture lies in that and where other cultures uh, lie in that and how then we can best relate in, in those situations and understanding that there are, you know, there, that, that there are different perspectives on different things. There just are. Uh, and so uh, people may see the world differently. It doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean they're right or wrong or, or good or bad. It just means that they are different and that our culture does impact our ethical uh, perspective and, and view of the world. In the end, we just, you know, intercultural communication is, is important because we are all connected more and more uh, on a daily basis. We are connected to people all around the world. We're connected to people in our community that we may not have been exposed to before. We're, we're just connected to people who are so different from us in many ways and yet so similar to us in many ways that intercultural communication really is the, um, the cornerstone for coming to a renewed understanding of one another for all of those reasons um, because of uh, increasing peace and a demographic knowledge and ethical understanding and all those different things. So intercultural communication really is just a responsibility that each of us has. If you have questions about anything related to intercultural communication, including why we study intercultural communication or why it might be important, any questions, comments, things, I'd welcome those. Please feel free to email me and be happy to chat with you about those. In the meantime, I hope you will um, really commit yourself to understanding not only your own culture, but that of others and the way that those things interact and engage in the process of intercultural communication.